to be faced. It need not be feared, but it cannot be ignored. Today, atomic energy is permeating many areas of our industrial, medical, and educational structure. The symbol of radiation, a magenta cross on a field of yellow, is to be found more and more in our everyday life as the goodness of the atom is applied increasingly to the peacetime field. Fighting fires involving radioactivity poses problems and hazards to the firefighter, but so do fires involving flammable liquids, explosives, or electrical equipment. Knowledge and understanding will enable firemen to cope with the special hazards of radioactive materials at a minimum risk to themselves and the general public. Just as training has minimized the hazard problems in dealing with ordinary fires, so in the nuclear age too, training is eliminating inordinate fear of radiation, giving us instead a respectful understanding of how to handle this firefighting hazard. The Atomic Energy Commission's fire department at the National Reactor Testing Station in Idaho is responsible for providing fire protection to more than 35 industrial type facilities situated about the 894 square mile station. Fire involving radiation is naturally a major concern of fire crews charged with protecting the nation's atomic installations. Looking toward the day when such a fire might occur, all members of the department are continually trained in all firefighting techniques, conventional fires as well as those involving nuclear materials. This program constantly stresses pre-fire planning. Here at the NRTS, of course, radiation is a prime hazard. So, of necessity, a great amount of special training is provided, covering both external and internal radiation hazards. Special fire service problems include such topics as radioactive health hazards to firefighters, handling of contaminated equipment, and possibility of exposure through release of radioactive substances, whether liquid or gaseous. In operating facilities, the use of high-activity radioactive materials is carefully controlled, always under the guidance of trained personnel with monitoring equipment so as to minimize exposure to personnel. In many areas where radioactive materials are stored, the air is under continual surveillance by special monitoring devices, such as the constant air monitor. However, in case of fire, the benefit of such controls or even professional advice may not be available. So our men must be trained in basic radiological safety. The firemen must understand the importance of time, distance, and shielding when fighting a fire involving radioactive materials. With more and more of our hospitals and small industrial concerns using radioactive materials, it becomes increasingly important that training be undertaken in how to combat such fires by all fire departments. To illustrate the techniques of fighting such a fire, let's observe how the Idaho Operations Office Fire Department at the National Reactor Testing Station would handle a simulated fire. The alarm operator is busy at his job. A training class is underway for the crew. Not far away is a storeroom containing shelves lined with products, some of which are radioactive. And under the ever watchful eye of a constant air monitor. A small fire starts on the floor beneath the shelving in a storeroom, one that quickly spreads to the cupboard itself. The radioactively contaminated smoke is immediately detected by the monitoring instrument, which lights a warning lamp. And sounds a bell alerting workers in the area that radioactive contamination is being released to the air. Discovering the fire, an alarm is pulled to summon firefighting apparatus. The signal is received on the main station console where the box location is punched out on a tape and an alarm is sounded throughout the fire station to turn the crew out. Crew officers make a quick check with the alarm operator as to location of the fire and more important, to check the building inspection report to see where radioactive materials are stored in the facility. The crew needs to know if a radiation hazard exists. Two crews respond to the fire, one to fight the blaze, 
the other to provide support by laying extra lines and to give a helping hand if needed. The approach to the building is made from the upwind direction to avoid exposure to airborne radioactive clouds resulting from the fire. Once at the fire scene, the men put on special protective clothing in addition to the regular turnout gear they normally wear to minimize the hazard involved. This consists of shoe covers, gloves, and masks. Shoe covers will cut down on the possibility of tracking contamination to other areas and protect the shoes. Gloves protect the hands from contamination. Self-contained respiratory equipment is donned since airborne contamination will cause internal exposure. And standard turnout gear affords protection to the rest of the firefighter's body. Protection that is well worth the few minutes spent getting into it. As a precaution, the entrance way to the building is monitored before the firemen go in to determine if they are entering a hazardous radiation field. Firefighters realize that entering a burning building is an above normal risk, but effective firefighting demands it. Radiation is just another risk. Time, distance, and shielding are important tools that must be put to use since they minimize the radiation hazard risk. Once the fire is out, the men quickly leave. The debris will be monitored and cleaned up by those trained in decontamination operations. Since every man at the scene of the fire is a potential spreader of radioactive contamination, each fireman is checked by a radiation monitor as he leaves the fire area. A safeguard check to find out whether the man may have picked up any radioactive material on his clothing. All protective clothing and equipment are removed and stacked in a special area for decontamination at a later date. All items are placed on blotter paper to prevent spreading any residual contamination clinging to them. The men also check their dosimeters for exposure. The gear removed is appropriately tagged so others will not handle it and thus spread the contamination. Firefighting equipment also must be checked and tagged if necessary for later decontamination. Following the return of the rigs to the station, the men are checked again by a radiation monitor to see if they may by chance have picked up any radioactive contamination on their hands, face, or clothing. As a final protection, they scrub down with soap and water, the best common decontaminating agents. While the fire is fresh in the men's minds, a critique is held. Here the procedures and techniques employed are gone over. Ways and means for improvement are discussed and adopted if practical. Each step is reviewed to make sure that it is needed and, if so, is its purpose understood. Shoe covers were put on for two reasons, to protect the fireman's feet and shoes and to prevent him from tracking radioactive material to other locations. Protective gloves were worn as a barrier between the hands and contaminated objects. A good rule where contamination is involved or suspected is to handle nothing unnecessarily with the bare hands since radioactive materials are extremely dangerous when in contact with bare skin. Special respiratory equipment was worn since airborne radioactivity was suspected. It is a must to wear some sort of self-contained mask from the time of arrival at the fire until the air samplers determine the area to be free from airborne contamination. One cannot know from observation whether radiation and contamination are present since they cannot be seen, felt, nor smelled. The passage leading into the building was monitored prior to entry, and a monitoring check was made frequently while the men were in the building. The men used time, shielding, and distance to minimize their risk by staying in the zone only a short time, staying as far away from the radiation field as practicable, 
and keeping something between themselves and the radiation source. Unfortunately, a lightweight portable shield does not exist, so firemen must take advantage of objects available at the fire. The men were monitored as they left the building. Each man removed his mask carefully, taking care that the glove fingers did not touch the face. Other items of protective equipment were stripped off in such a manner as to minimize chances of transferring contamination to the lungs, skin, or work clothes. While stripping equipment off, every man in the fire area also made a check of his dosimeter to satisfy himself whether he received any significant amount of exposure. This quick check of the self-reading dosimeter gives the fireman an immediate indication whether he may have been exposed to a high radiation field not detected by other monitoring devices employed. The dosimeter, since it gives an immediate record of external radiation received, should be worn whenever one enters a suspected radiation field. Another precaution to be taken where heavy smoke contamination is suspected is for all men in the fire zone to be washed down with a hose immediately after leaving the building. This will tend to minimize chances of spreading contamination to the firefighter's other clothing while protective equipment is being removed. The hoses, nozzles, and other equipment used also were carefully monitored. Radiation cannot be seen, smelled, nor felt, so the men must again be carefully checked by a monitor for skin and clothing contamination. They also will turn in their film badges for reading. The film badge contains a small piece of dental x-ray film which is sensitive to radiation. Since it will be darkened in proportion to the amount of radiation received, it provides a permanent record of the amount of radiation encountered. Even though cleared by the monitor, the men scrubbed themselves down with soap and water as a further precaution. The use of radioisotopes is becoming more frequent as man turns more and more to developing the beneficial uses of the atom. These increased uses pose special problems to the firefighter, but through intelligent training, firemen are capable of coping with radiation fire hazards. The training needed to minimize the risk may be obtained right along with conventional firefighting techniques. Experience at atomic energy installations to date indicate that radiation in connection with fires is just another hazard to experienced, well-trained firemen.